All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Even before I introduce myself, I want to jump to our translation. All right. So uh, we have French interpretation today. So kindly click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and you can choose your language. And when you choose your language, then you can mute the original audio. Original audio will be in English today. So we'll give everyone a minute to select their language. All right, let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, my name is Sherry Evans. I'm um, a Senior Principal Technical Advisor at MCGL in Chapaigo. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar um, on cesarean section and um, placenta accreta spectrum. Um, a few uh, instructions before I turn it over to our moderator. Um, please take a moment right now to feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. However, any questions and that you're looking to ask at any time during the webinar, please put those in the Q&A. And so we'll have the Q&A open during the entire time. And then at the end of our uh, speaker presentations, we'll be opening the floor so people can ask questions. All right, so feel free to introduce yourself in the chat right now. And I would like to turn this over to Kusum Papa, uh, a longstanding colleague and friend um, and the moderator of this webinar. Kusum, welcome. Thank you so much, Sherry. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Kusum Papa. I'm an obstetrician and a gynecologist uh, working as principal technical advisor for Momentum Con Global Country Leadership and Jupaigo. I'm also the president-elect of the South Asian Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Welcome everyone to day one of our first three-day webinar series focused on placenta accreta syndrome. As we know, this is uh, becoming increasingly common and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. It is therefore of great concern and something that needs to be looked into urgently. So today is an exciting day. Today you will hear about the epidemiology, pathogenesis, prevention of this important conditions. We will now move to the, um, so um, day two, uh, that is tomorrow, we will talk about the antenatal diagnosis and day three will be about the management. So it would be really great if you all can join for all three days. Uh, so now we will take a quick survey. What you, yeah, what you can uh, do is either the follow the link that is put in your chat box, or, uh, or you can just pull out your phone and scan this QR code, and we are then ready to go. So if any of you all have any problems, please uh, feel free to reach out. We would really want this to be a very interactive uh, session. So uh, please uh, let's uh, all get together for this. So the first question is, what are some risk factors for placenta accreta syndrome, a spectrum? Great, we have the questions coming up. So this is interesting. You can see in your screen the responses and the size of 
the responses is also something which most of you all have mentioned. Great, everybody's had an opportunity. Okay, so what are the global prevalence rate of placenta accreta spectrum? So that's the other, other poll. And we would love to hear what I, all of you all think. The numbers are given below. Are you all having with the uh, problems with the poll or is okay? Okay, great. That's that's great. So now uh, let me take this opportunity to really introduce our two eminent speakers who will walk you through the epidemiology, pathogenesis, and prevention of this important condition and really help us with the discussion of um, the placenta accreta spectrum. I would first like to introduce uh, Dr. John Viralo, who's an obstetrician and a gynecologist and a team lead for Women's Health Program at Global Surgery Foundation, who's leading an effort on safe cesarean section care and optimizing cesarean section rates in low middle income countries. He's based in Washington, D.C., and works clinically at the Peace Health Medical Center at Ketchikan, Alaska. I would like to now introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Doris Bithi, uh, is, and she's a practicing obstetrician gynecologist, over 15 years of clinical and surgical experience, uh, mainly in rural Kenya. She is a dedicated trainer and mentor with Obstetric Safe Surgery Kenya, a program that aims at improving the quality of cesarean section for better maternal and newborn outcomes. So over to you, John, um, to get us started on this. Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, thank you, uh, Kusum, for the kind introduction and warm welcome. And thank you to the organizers uh, for arranging this uh, interesting uh, and important webinar series. And uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, you know, good, good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever you're joining. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to be here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, please, uh, next slide. Uh, and we have no conflicts of interest to declare. Next slide. The outline that we'll, we'll have for the next uh, 30 minutes. So I, I want to take the first half of uh, this session, and then I'll be uh, passing it over to uh, Doris, Dr. Beefy, 
And I'll be covering uh, background and importance of PAS, uh, classification, uh, epidemiology, uh, and pathogenesis, and then passing over to uh, Doris, who will uh, take us through clinical risk factors and prevention. Next slide, please. So uh, PAS, uh, so placenta accreta spectrum, PAS is a very complex uh, obstetric uh, complication, um, and it results in very significant uh, maternal morbidity. Uh, this includes uh, hemorrhage, shock, uh, injuries, uh, inc uh, including urinary uh, injuries, uh, and often results in peripartum hysterectomy and also even uh, causes death. Um, and what we've seen is that this is becoming increasingly common uh, and the, it's uh, paralleling the, uh, the rapid increase in cesarean section rates. Uh, and one of the challenges is that historically there's been really a, a wide range of descriptions and criteria uh, for, uh, for PAS. And, uh, but also, often without this differentiation between adherence forms of uh, PAS, like uh, placenta accreta, and uh, invasive forms, uh, placenta increta and, and percreta. Uh, and what this, this challenge then results in a wide variation in reported prevalence. And it's important uh, for us to know this because the different forms of PAS have different outcomes uh, and require different management uh, strategies to improve, uh, to improve uh, clinical outcomes. And if we uh, have more accurate differentiation uh, between the adherent and the invasive uh, PAS forms, this will help improve our epidemiology, our understanding, and will help inform better development of, uh, and better, of, of better management uh, strategies. Next slide, please. And so for this slide, what it illustrates the, the, the importance of PAS, uh, as well as the, uh, the increased risk of uh, complications. Uh, this is a, uh, a 2021 study in the US uh, that uh, looked at uh, nearly 3 million cesarean sections. Uh, and during that study period, there was uh, just over 8,000 uh, PAS uh, conditions. And, and that came to a prevalence rate of 0.29%. Uh, uh, on the, the left column, what you see is that uh, cesarean section that's complicated by PAS is associated, with, markedly associated with the increased risk of uh, all these different conditions. So any surgical morbidities, 78% uh, for those with PAS versus 10% for non-PAS. And you can see these, the, the other conditions. So severe maternal morbidity, hemorrhage, shock, urinary tract uh, injury, and death markedly increased in uh, women who have uh, PAS. Then the importance of looking at subtypes uh, is uh, illustrated on the right-hand side. So uh, for the uh, adherent uh, forms like placenta accreta, certainly a, a very much increased risk compared to non-PAS, but for placenta uh, increta and percreta, the invasive forms, you have uh, double and up to five times higher uh, risk of uh, complications associated with that. Uh, next slide, please. And so now, now taking a uh, look at the historical uh, perspective, uh, this the first cohort study was done more than uh, 80 years ago. This was in 1937, and this is Irving and Hertig, who looked at 106 cases, um, and they were all described as adherent, so placenta accreta. And they used two different uh, criteria, so clinical criteria and histologic criteria. Clinically, uh, it was a placenta that's adherent to the uterine wall without easy separation and or bleeding from the placental bed. And then uh, histologically, um, where there was an absence of the decidual or uh, nidobuch uh, layer between the placenta and the myometrium. So the needle book uh, layer is a, it's a, essentially it's a tissue plane uh, and it's a decidualized endometrial stroma or fibrinous layer between the myometrium and, and the placenta. And that, that helps with the, when um, in the third stage for the, the, the separation of, of the placenta. Um, so that's what we're seeing in these, in PIS is that that's absent. Predisposing factors 
for uh, uh, developing PAS is uh, in in these in this series was damage to the uterine wall, and in this case it was, uh, for example, manual removal of the placenta and or history of uterine uh, curettage. Uh, and this was uh, this was before the development of antibiotics, and so these were often associated with uh, or complicated by endometritis. And this you know, this kind of injury from, from manual removal or uterine keratitis, uh, along with the endometritis, likely resulted in scar tissue forming uh, focally within the superficial myometrium. Uh, and this is not comparable to cesarean section, as we'll see, which has a much larger um, or extensive myometrial scar uh, that, that is caused. Uh, next slide, please. So classification of PAS. And this is where it becomes important when we're talking about really uh, getting a better understanding of the, uh, of the epidemiology. And this comes from, from FIGO. And you see the three different grades, uh, grade one, Two and three, grade one is the adherent placenta, so essentially placenta accreta. And this is where the uh, villi attach directly to the surface of the myometrium um, rather than uh, the decidua, so you don't, uh, without penetrating it. Um, so you don't have the, uh, the endometrial or the, the decidua uh, inter, uh, interposing between it. And you see that on the, the, uh, on the normal uh, part of the, the graphic. Um, I'm sorry, the, the normal part of it, you see the normal, then that the accreta, you see that you don't have that uh, interposing uh, endometrial or decidual layer. Then grade two is increta. And th this is where you have the villi penetration or invasion into the, uh, into the myometrium, but not to the serosal layer. And then uh, grade C, uh, grade three, is uh, invasive placenta per creta. And this is where you have the villi penetration uh, or invasion that reaches the serosa uh, and uh, potentially beyond to surrounding pelvic tissues, vessels, and organs. And you have the three different grades there. So you have one or 3A that, uh, that is uh, limited to the uterine serosa, 3B into, uh, has urinary bladder invasion, and then uh, 3C into uh, invasion to other pelvic tissues or organs. So for example, the, the, uh, the broad ligament. And this classification includes clinical and histologic uh, criteria. Of note is that within uh, a, a specimen, you can have different grades of PAS. So it's important to examine uh, all, all, the different, uh, all the different grades. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at prevalence, so this is a, a 2019 uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of 29 uh, uh, articles representing 18 countries. And the pooled prevalence rates, and this is uh, globally, uh, so think back to the, the Menti uh, polling, uh, is globally the rate is 0.17%. Uh, but there's going to be uh, ranges uh, very, uh, across countries. Um, and this was uh, when they, this um, study examined uh, 5.7 million births, and we had uh, it's, uh, just over 7,000 cases of PAS. Um, and so the pool prevalence of 0.17%, but the prevalence rates ranged from 0 0.01 to as high as 1.1%. Uh, but there is challenges uh, with, the, uh, with the wide variation in rates and changes due to data quality, um, and standardization of uh, classification. In this as well, if you look at the types and frequencies of abnormal placentation, placenta accreta, um, or the adherent type, is the, the most common, so 62.5%. And uh, the uh, invasive forms uh, account for approximately 37.5%. Next slide, please. Now, if we look at the trends for uh, PIS, uh, PAS rates and C uh, CS rates, you'll see that there's a, a correlation uh, with it. Uh, that study mentioned earlier, that cohort study was Irving and Hertig in 1937, and the estimated incidence of placenta accreta was one per 30,000 uh, births. So that's 0.0033%. And then if you look at the compared, uh, you compare that to the pooled estimate of 0.17%. And these were studies done between 1981 and 2012 is you know 50 times greater um, rate. So you can see this uh, a dramatic increase. And 
cesarean section rates globally uh, started increasing in, in the 1960s. Um, so that's where we really see uh, taken off, and especially the last several decades where we see a dramatic uh, increase uh, in uh, uh, CS rates. And if on the right hand side, if you look, this is the uh, US data. And we see in the 1980s, for example, that one in 1,250 pregnancies had PIS. Um, and so that's a rate of 0.08% and a uh, cesarean section rate of 12.5%. And then it's just, you, know, you can look at it th through the years with the increasing PS rate uh, paralleling the increase in cesarean section rate, where now in 2016, uh, it's PS occurs in one out of 272. Uh, so a PAS rate of 0.37%, so much higher than that old prevalence rate, and a cesarean section rate in the U.S. of 31.9%. And we're seeing a, a, a similar increases in, in other countries, uh, paralleling the increase in cesarean section rates. And not only is the PAS rate increasing, but uh, increasing proportion of invasive uh, PAS over the past several decades. Uh, it was uh, primary, It was around 70% um, uh, placenta accreta uh, and 30% uh, the invasive forms. And now it's closer to a 60-40 split. Uh, but again, there's uh, challenges uh, with, with the data. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about pathogenesis. Uh, next slide, please. So historically, um, what we've uh, how PS has been described is as a spectrum of abnormal attachments of villous tissue to the uterine wall. And this ranges from that superficial attachments uh, to the uh, inner myometrium and without that interposing decidua or the nidabuch uh, layer, and that's placenta accreta, to all the way to, uh, to, uh, to invasion into, into the myometrium and transmural invasion through the entire uterine wall and, and beyond. And this model the, uh, says that the primary defect was the biological function of the villous tissue that leads to this excessive invasion of the myometrium uh, beyond that, the, that physiologic uh, uh, plane. Um, and so that's, you know, it's uh, very different than what, what, what we're uh, really seeing uh, now. So, um, uh, so ne ne next slide, please. So the newer thinking is that it's not a primary defect of the biological function of the placental villi, but purely a prim primarily a scar defect with placental tissue developing inside that defect. And so this is really uh, a consequence of uterine remodeling and scar formation following injury. So primarily cesarean section. And many of you uh, said that the, uh, the risk factor for, uh, for PAS is cesarean section. Now that, that, that is the most common uh, risk factor that, uh, that we have. And what happens here is that it's a, um, uh, an absence of uh, endome endometrial reformation, uh, a failure of normal decidualization during pregnancy, and then also a loss of this subdecidual myometrium and or its replacement with scar tissue. And so these changes are associated with the distortion of the needle book layer that I, I mentioned earlier and the loss of the parts of this, you know, physiological site of de detachment, this tissue plane uh, at the, um, of the placenta from the uterine wall. So that's really important. So it's very different than kind of this the villi are, you know, it's more of a biologic effect, but it's more around this, uh, this scar defect. And when the placenta implants at the area of defective decidualization, this leads to the villi uh, migrating into the myometrium and reaching the, the larger uterine uh, circulation. Um, and this then can also uh, sometimes extends to the serosa and, and beyond. Um, and what we see here is that, and you see various, this diagram here on the, the far left in A, it's really just uh, attachments at, at the scar. Um, B is where there's, um, where the implantation is taking uh, effect fully inside this uh, cesarean uh, scar defect. And C is where it's just uh, partially inside the cesarean scar uh, defect. Um, and D is uh, looking at um, other uh, risk factors for, uh, 
for developing PAS such as uh, bicornuate uterus or uh, uterine fibroids. And this tends to be more associated with these microscopic uh, endometrial defects that allow um, uh, attachment. Um, so in this model, the deep uh, villus um, you know, attachment inside the myometrium is not a result of in, you know, abnormal villus invasiveness, but it's more likely due to the development of anchoring villi uh, through these microscopic gaps in the myometrial scar. Um, next slide, please. And so now I'll uh, hand over to uh, Doris, Dr. Beathy, to take us through uh, clinical risk factors and prevention. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, John, for the wonderful presentation. So uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon from where you are joining us from. I'll discuss the clinical risk factors and uh, the prevention of a placenta accreta spectrum. So um, placenta previa after CS is the most important risk factor, and I'll elaborate on that uh, later. And uh, most of the times we will find uh, of the reviews that have been done, 80% of patients with PAS will have a history of a previous CS birth, curatinge, and or myomectomy, which causes injury to the endometrium. So this is adopted from a publication by Eric Jarniax uh, on the risk factors, just a bit of classification. So the first one is under surgical scar injury, uh, caesarean section being the first one, then uh, surgical termination of pregnancy, uh, dilatation and curettage, myomectomy, endometrial resection, and Asherman syndrome, which cause direct injury to the endometrium. Uh, then there are non-surgical injuries like manual removal of placenta, endometritis, IUD, uh, uterine artery embolization, chemotherapy and uh, radiation, and IVF procedures. So these ones can be associated with microscopic defects in the endometrium leading to abnormal decidualization. The uterine anomalies can also be associated with the PS, like biconuate uterus, as we have been shown, and then submucosal fibrase and adenomyosis. Next slide, please. So the, we, we have heard from John that uh, as cesarean section rate increase, the risk of PAS also increases. So this is a prospective observational cohort study of 30,132 women who had cesarean section without labor. And we can appreciate that the frequency of PAS in these women increased as the number of cesarean sections increased. So you can see from the first years, the rate was about 0.24% uh, and kept increasing to, but remained less than 1% by the third CS but increases by almost four times by the time you're doing the fourth CS and the fifth CS. And by the sixth CS, their uh, frequency is at 6.74%. So this can be explained by the injury that happens with the re repeat caesarean sections and uh, with uterine remodeling and uh, uh, scar tissue formation, which tends to increase with the more caesarean sections that are performed. And this now leads to the formation of uh, what we'll discuss later as the uterine niche, which is a risk factor for PAS. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, uh, yeah. So the next in the next slide, we are going to discuss about placenta previa. And we need to note that placenta previa is actually the most important risk factor for PAS. So uh, the frequency of PAS increases with an increasing number of uh, cesarean births, but it is, the increase is markedly higher if the client has a previous cesarean section and placenta previa. So if you look at that graph, the, light, the blue line shows the frequency of PAS in clients with uh, placenta previa, and the, the, the orange line shows the frequency in patients without placenta previa. So you can see there's a marked difference. Uh, so with the first years, the risk is about 3% 3, 3 of the patients who have placenta previa. So that keeps increasing by the time we are doing the sixth cesarean section, the frequency it is at 67%. So when placenta previa is diagnosed, the possibility of uh, PAS should be considered and this is particularly important when the placenta is anterior 
and lies over the prior caesarean incision scar. And these are clients, if we are not able to make a, a diagnosis of a PAS, they are clients who should ideally deliver in a center where hemorrhage as a result of PAS can be addressed. Next slide, please. Yes, so we, when we, we have a PAS without placenta previa, those pregnancies complicated by PAS without previa are much less likely to be associated with prior caesarean deliveries and uh, use of assisted reproductive technology and a previous uterine procedure uh, such as myomectomy or uh, dilatation and curettage appears to be risk factors for PAS without placenta previa. Next slide, please. So other clinical risk factors include uh, smoking. Uh, in the pregnancy interval of less than 18 months has been shown to increase the risk of PAS in some uh, uh, clients. Infertility and or infertility procedures, multiple gestations and uh, maternal age more than 35 years. So these have been uh, have come up in literature as some of the risk factors for PAS. But the most important is the placenta previa. So now we can go to the next slide. We do the prevention. So we'll discuss prevention and uh, next slide, please. So when you look at prevention of placenta uh, creator spectrum, uh, number one is to focus, we need to focus on two areas. One is to reduce the number of caesarean sections because we've learned that as the CSs increase, the PAS cases also increase. And the second one is to address surgical procedures, uh, prevention of uterine niche formation. And I will discuss that in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Yeah, so when you look at uh, global figures is that there's a rising CS rate with a rate of 21%, 21.1%, up from uh, 5% in the 90s. And uh, there's a discrepancy between the regions. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, the average CS rate is about 5% which may indicate underuse with women ha having no access to caesarean sections. Uh, in Eastern Asia, the average rate was shown to be around 33.7%, which may suggest uh, overuse. So, but, and the CS rate continues to rise and uh, the projections are that by 2030, globally, the CS rate will be 28.5%. And 7% uh, of that happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and 63% happening in Eastern Asia. So even when you look at countries in the same region, you find there's a wide uh, intra, intra country uh, ranges. And even within the same country, there is a marked difference between uh, Caesarean section rates based on either the facility level and uh, the, the setting where the facility is, either it's local or in a, an, an urban area. Next slide, please. So for us to be able to prevent PAS, we need to uh, act on reducing the number of caesarean sections. And uh, it's important to understand and address the driving factors for caesarean sections. So we have their schematic representation of different factors that affect frequency of caesarean use. And when you look at that diagram is that at the center is the clinical factors uh, where like all women are uh, uh, classified into 10 groups by the Robson classification, all women coming to deliver. So we have clinical risk fa uh, uh, factors that drive uh, caesarean sections. Then in the outer rings, it looks at the other non-clinical factors that can affect the caesarean section rates. In the inner ring, it's about the women and the community and uh, the broader society. And uh, in the, the second ring is the health professionals and the health teams. And the outer ring talks about the health systems, financial reimbursement, incentives, and organizational design and cultures. So some of the, the, the prevention uh, measures to reduce caesarean section need to focus on all these areas because it is a complex kind of a scenario and it will require interventions at the multiple levels so that you're able to achieve a, a, a good uh, result in the reduction and also contextualization of the measures that are going to be applied. So it's a complex uh, um, uh, procedure to work on reduction of caesarean sections. Next slide, please. So now we're going to move to the surgical technique. And uh, in the surgical technique is that I need to discuss a bit on development of the uterine niche. 
because from the pathophysiology, we have heard that uh, the placenta usually tend to attack in an area of uh, uh, defective uh, decidualization. And uh, when there's a defect, then the placenta can penetrate and attach in the myometrium and extend to the other layers of the uterus. So a uterine niche is an important risk factor. And it's a triangular and echoic area at the site of the previous uterine caesarean section, as you can see that uh, uh, picture there. So at the apex is the residual myometrial thickness. And uh, so it can also be described as myometrial indentation of more than two millimeters depth. Uh, no, when you look at a large niche, which is also a, a risk factor for PAS, is that it's considered to be large if the depth of the niche is more than 50% or even 80% in some studies of the myometrial wall. And there's a wide variation of the, the, the definition of that. Then the, it can also be described as the the residual myometrial thickness less than 2.2 on transvaginal ultrasound or less than 2.5 on sonohysterogram. So that dehiscence increases the risk of uh, placenta accretor spectrum and uh, cesarean sections increase the incidence of niche to and, but the wide, wide range between 56 to 84% following a previous uh, cesarean section. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, we look at the factors that are uh, associated with the development of a uterine niche. And we have surgical technique related factors and patient related factors. So surgical technique related factors uh, include location of the uterine incision, uterine incision closure technique, and activities that can induce addition formation. Then there are patient related factors that can hamper normal wound healing and related agenesis. But for the sake of this discussion, we'll focus more on the surgical techniques. Next slide, please. So when you look at the location of and timing of uterine incision, the risk of development of a uterine niche and a PAS uh, spectrum is associated with very low uterine incision. And these very low uterine incisions tend to go through the cervical tissue, which impairs wound healing lead because of accumulation of mucus from the cervical glands. Formation of retention cysts, which will tend to enlarge over time and enlarge the uterine niche. So this tends to the, the risk of uh, low incisions tends to increase when CSAs are performed with a defaced cervix or after onset of uh, contractions in uh, patients who are more than five centimeters with a lower station of the presenting part, and uh, also development of a bladder flap uh, increases the chances of having a low uterine segment, uh, a lower incision, which goes through the cervical tissue. Then uh, there's this uh, review that uh, highlighted that both uterine incision and the use of a bladder flap are two preventable risk factors for uterine niche or ismocil formation. Um, so the next slide, please. So the next slide, we are going to look at the closure of the uterine incision. And uh, we focus on this meta-analysis of about 20 studies uh, involving 15,000, more than 15,000 women. So this, uh, the findings were that the residual myometrial thickness decreased by 1.26 millimeters after single compared with double layer closure of the uterus, particularly when uh, 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 locked sutures were used. So, the, so that shows advantage for the double layer closure. Uh, healing ratio, which is the ratio between the residual myometrial uh, thickness and the adjacent myometrial thickness decreased after the single layer closure um, by those numbers, particularly in the case of locked sutures. And then uterine niche for prevalence increased when the deciduo was excluded from the closure. So this meta-analysis all uh, findings all point towards a better scar healing or uh, on ultrasound after a double layered closure and uh, especially when the sutures are unlocked in, and uh, if the decidua is included. But uh, future studies that measure the niche features and their relation with long-term consequences are needed before solid recommendations can be made on the preferred closure technique for the uterine incision. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the next one we discuss about addition uh, prevention. So post op additions can uh, theoretically cause the retraction of the uterine scar tissue towards the abdominal wall, opposite to the direction of the retraction tissue in the uterine scar. 
resulting in suboptimal approximation and healing of the myometrium. The pool may be increased by gravity if the uterus is retroflexed. Uh, this is supported by the frequent observation of additions attached between the uterus at the apex of a myometrial niche and the abdominal wall or the bladder flap. So addition formation and possibly uterine niche has been observed as a long-term outcome of peritoneal non-closure in uh, meta-analysis. But you know, non-closure of the peritoneum has been shown to have other benefits, including uh, less uh, addition formation and the practices for non more of the non-closure. Next slide, please. So the other factors that are associated with the uh, addition formation and those include inadequate hemostasis, inflammation due to infection, tissue ischemia, devascularization, tissue manipulation, the suture material, and closure of the pareto peritoneum, especially after bladder flap, and use of addition prevention uh, barriers, which are, are being investigated. So in summary, the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in summary, the rates of PAS have increased significantly over the past several decades, likely due to a rapid increase in CS. Uh, PAS is a complex obstetric complication resulting in significant maternal morbidity and mortality. Pathogenesis of PAS development is due to uterine remodeling and scar formation or defect rather than a primary defect of the biological uh, function of the villous tissue. Identifying the risk factors of PAS disorders is essential to reduce the morbidity and the mortality related to this disease. Each uterine surgery and each caesarean increases the risk for PAS disorder and its consequences. So the first step is the reduction of the number of caesarean sections. And once a decision is meant to perform a CS, it is important to know which factors impair proper wound healing in order to prevent niche formation. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this great presentation. So now um, uh, we've really ha heard a lot about um, uh, this uh, past. So what we would now like to open the floor for questions. Uh, now, this is your time, all of you all, to really talk to uh, Dr. John Veralo as well as Dr. Doris. So what we would encourage you to do is if you can just type your questions in the Q&A or raise your hands. And uh, so we will start by taking two questions from the Q&A box and we'll also then turn to raised hands. So we will have an opportunity to unmute you when your name is called and uh, then we can have this uh, open discussion uh, with the two, the, the two great uh, presenters. So please, if you can type, okay, so, uh, okay, so this is not a question. Uh, let me see if anybody's raised their hands. So Kasum, okay. um, I'll read you one from the Q&A. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, we could do that. We could yeah. do that. Yeah, let me read this first question. So if PAS is primarily due to uterine remodeling and scar formation or scar defect, how does it occur in a woman without prior history of any uterine surgery? Thank you, Sherry. Over to you, John or Doris. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here, okay? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think you know what we showed in what uh, uh, Dr. Beathy was showing about the clinical risk factors, um, one thing we just need to realize that the cesarean section, prior cesarean section, is the most common factor. Um, and uh, but the, we do have these uncommon cases that that occur. And the feeling is that it's similar to um, like when we look at the uh, the Hertig and Irving uh, study uh, when we didn't have many cesarean sections that look at the the predisposing factor. So there was some uh, there is the manual removal of the placenta or um, a uterine curettage, um, and there was, so there was some superficial uh, injury to the to the myometrium. Now the thinking of for example like the uh, bicornuate uterus or the submucosal fibroid. Um, or adenomyosis is that there's uh, they're probably associated with this 
uh, microscopic uh, endometrial defects um, that interfere with normal biological function, uh, endometrial functions, uh, and the decidualization. So it, it allows, thereby, it, it allows this abnormal placental uh, attachment. Um, so that's what can can explain some of it. And we think that, for example, um, I think some of you actually said advanced age is another uh, risk factor, and it is. But it's probably uh, it's confounding a bit because there's other elements that that are potentially going on that have uh, an impact on the uh, um, on the uh, endometrium and, and how it functions. So there's probably some of that you know endometrial defect that um, that mimics to a degree the the, uh, the endometrial defects that we see uh, following cesarean section. Now, obviously, the defects following cesarean section, especially multiple cesarean sections, become much more important uh, because they're, they're larger defects and, and larger, uh, larger scar uh, um, development. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Evelyn, who uh, thanks you for the presentation, but also wants clarification on does double closure uh, double layer closure, interlocking, and bladder flap increase or reduce the risk of pass, and probably she would uh, uh, need more explanation on that. Thank you. Over to you, John. Uh, Doris, do you want to take that? Yes, maybe I can take. I can take that. So, with the um, evidence that is available, shows that uh, double layer closure with a, a unlocking uh, sutures has been associated with less uh, cases of uh, uterine niche formation. And uh, we know that uh, uterine niche is a, a, a defect in the myometrium. So when there is such a defect, then that increases the risk of uh, development of uh, placenta accretor spectrum or abnormal uh, attachment of the placenta. So double layer and uh, using unlocking uh, sutures has been uh, shown to reduce the risk of niche formation at uh, by ultrasound. So, but we don't have long-term studies that have been uh, 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 published to show the relation between the niche formation and uh, long-term in the placental accretor spectrum. But yes, um, yeah, that is the evidence that is available for that. Uh, some of the reasons is that when you use the locking sutures, and um, there's a high risk of having uh, uh, ischemia of the uterine muscle. And that leads to has having a thinner residual myometrial uh, thickness and uh, increased risk of uh, uterine niche formation. Yes. Yeah, and, and if I, and if I could, could add, yeah, and that's and exactly what uh, Dora says there. And uh, as she said, that the it's not str real strong evidence. And so some of the the studies have uh, there's a little bit conflicting, and it, some of it could be due to uh, surgical proficiency and, and uh, the uh, technique it, itself. But the, yeah, the 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 theory behind it is around the. Uh, kind of the ischemia uh, developed, and also uh, developing. You know, if you're able to uh, uh, do a double layer closure, because sometimes if it's repeat, it's, it's incredibly thin, and it's very difficult to do that. But then that helps with that residual uh, myometrial thickness uh, as well. Thanks. So, John, there is this uh, also the, the same question from Peter. So what would the recommendations be in terms of reducing uterine uh, neck uh, for locking versus uh, not locking? So as you've just mentioned yeah. that it is not locking. Uh, right. like, um, so that's, I think uh, that would answer Peter's uh, question. Yeah, and and I know that it has been a, it's a common uh, training is, is to do that locking because you you want to have that hemostasis. Uh, you're saying because it's a, a vascular area, but it's been shown that uh, that unlocking you can get the, the same hemostasis, and then you don't have the the concern about you know developing some ischemia, and then that the the uterine niche. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. I don't see anybody's hands raised, but there is another question, which uh, is, does a short interpregnancy interval 
increase uh, the risk of pass? And if so, how does that, what's the explanation behind it? Yeah, over to you, John. Yeah, I, I can uh, I can start and then uh, I hand over to to Doris. So it does appear that a, a short uh, interval, um, uh, an interpregnancy interval, does increase the risk of, uh, of of a pass, and it's the along the same lines of uh, thinking of the it's the uterine remodeling and the same thing with the in, the increased risk of uterine dehiscence or uterine rupture, um, uh, you know, following a short uh, interpregnancy interval. And I do believe that there's a, a study that um, showed that it was it's uh, more common in uh, younger women or under the age of 25 uh, for the uh, interval uh, shorter interval pregnancy. Um, but I'll note, uh, Doris, if you want to add anything uh, to that as well. Yeah, I um, okay with that response. I don't have anything else to add. Just to note that uh, it's not come out in most of the uh, literature, but uh, in uh, uh, one study that showed that the risk increases with a uh, uh, short interpregnancy interval of less than uh, eighteen months. Thank you. There, there is another uh, question. Um, I think. Um, um, Saruja has a question. What would be the life-saving steps if pass or placenta previa is an accidental finding in remote or primary CMOX site during emergency cesarean section? I believe that's going to come out on day yeah. three. <laughs> that will come out, Saruja. That will come out on day three. And similarly, uh, Boss has a question about the diagnostic approach, which will be there in day two. Mm. So I think that I would encourage all of you all to be there for day two and day three. Day two, we will be talking about the diagnosis. And day three, we will be talking about uh, the management of uh, PASS. So... Uh, thank you, thank you, John. Um, yeah, it's a good. It's a, uh, so this was a good setup for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is one more question which mentions: Please comment on fundal accreta risk factors and surgical uterine preservation. So maybe surgical uterine preservation techniques will be for uh, bar will be for the um, third day, but um, fundal accreta risk factors. If there is anything John would want to highlight. Uh, John or Doris, please. Oh, Doris, do you want to start? Yeah, for fundal accreta risk factors, um, I, I, I know we've discussed that uh, placenta previa is the most common uh, risk factor for uh, PAS. Uh, so, and that usually will happen on the lower uterine segment. But for the fundal crater uh, 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 spectrum, could be associated with some microscopic injuries on the endometrium, maybe from uh, uh, surgical procedures other than cesarean section, like uh, myomectomies, uh, uh, dilatation and curettage, or uh, uh, even fibroids, uh, sub submucosal fibroids. So that could be more associated with some microscopic uh, uh, injuries to the endometrium. Uh, which are now resulting from those other procedures apart from the um, uh, caesarean section itself. Thank you. I don't know if John has something to add. No, that, that covers it. Um, and again, these are going to be uh, quite rare uh, to see. Uh, but uh, yeah, but the, the, uh, just like uh, Doris was saying, those other uh, risk factors um, would need to likely be present for those uh, uh, endometrial defects. Thanks. So just one more question is from Regina, and she wants to further clarify uh, the closure of peritoneum. Does it increase or reduce ad um, adhesions and its role in placenta accreta? Probably, Regina, is that's what you would want to. John, maybe you could take that, the closure of the peritoneum. Yeah, and I think again, this is another one that uh, has some mixed, um, you know, information or, or data uh, around it. Um, there's some some conflicting evidence uh, for it, but I think the um, what they've finding is that uh, some of the, the you know that uh, closure of the peritoneum 
overall, uh, that, or non-closure of the peritoneum does reduce uh, adhesions. Uh, I think one of the concerns is whether uh, closure or non-closure in in uh, increases adhesions of the anterior um, uterus to the uh, anterior uh, abdominal wall. Um, I don't know, uh, Doris, if you wanted to uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, when when we look at uh, um, the the meta analysis that we referred to, uh, shows that uh, an enclosure of the peritoneum was uh, shown to increase the risk of uh, uterine niche formation, and uh, so there is a lot of uh, conflicting uh, uh, evidence because when you look at the cesarean section uh, trials, the big trials, the coronis and the Caesar trials. Uh, the short term, there was a short term benefit for non closure of the peritoneum, but we don't have uh, solid evidence for the long term um, uh, benefits of the non closure of the peritoneum. Thank you. Yeah, and and the other part about the um, about the non non closure, there's other elements to it. It's uh, not around uh, around PAS, but you know, enhanced recovery after surgery, and they've shown that. Non-closure, you have uh, you know, one that there's you know, less use of suture. Um, there's a, a quicker return to bowel function um, and uh, less uh, d discomfort. So there, there's there's kind of trade-offs you know, uh, for that. In general, um, what we've been teaching is non-closure of, of the peritoneum, both visceral and uh, parietal. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is really exciting. Great questions from all of you. And uh, um, stay tuned for tomorrow and day after for some of the questions which were really not uh, answered, which will be covered on day two and day three. So thank you so much, uh, John and Doris, for laying out the classification, epidemiology, pathogenesis, and clinical uh, factors and prevention for this important conditions. Uh, and also well uh, highlighting the need to understand, address the driving factors for optimizing cesarean reads, as well as the appropriate techniques. I think those are, those are very important things, which really is important for us. And most important, I would like to thank all of you all. And we are really looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow for day two in the PASS webinar series, which will be focusing on the diagnosis of antenatal diagnosis of PASS. And uh, just um, remember that you will use the same link for tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you once again, uh, John, Doris, and thank you, everyone. And uh, see you all tomorrow, same time, same link. And um, yeah, more questions <laughs> and more interactions. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank Bye you, everyone. Thank you.